I want to welcome everybody. The name of this webinar is the Sustainable Landscape Design Working with Builders. And um, it's really uh, one in the series of, uh, 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 one, one of the webinars in a, in a series called A Focus on Sustainability. And a little bit of background is that uh, there's a bunch of ecological organizations that got together to try to put together this uh, series of webinars. Uh, and all of these groups are actually really well known in their regional areas, and they're really well known for their education. They're, they're nonprofits, mostly volunteer uh, you know, organizations. And we got together and we really said, how can we kind of extend that um, educational reach? And that's kind of how this whole series came about. And in case you're not familiar with them, I, I mentioned the organizations are the Ecological Landscape Association, which I'm part of. That's mainly in the Northeast United States, the Chesapeake Conservation Landscape Council, which is in the Washington, D.C. area, MILA, which is the Midwest Ecological Landscape Alliance, and the Eco Landscape California, which is, is in the West. And it's been wonderful to have that all those groups work together. Um, so this is really our first, um, you know, first take at uh, doing these webinars. So uh, we really appreciate that you guys are, are, are on the, on this. And um, I guess what I, the first thing I want to do is tell you is that like, some of you have found the question uh, section in your panel, on your control panel, but panel, but that's where you guys will be feeding us questions. And uh, we will have the, op you'll have the opportunity throughout uh, at points in the webinar to ask some questions. So, um, you know, just locate that and make sure that you kind of are familiar with that. Um, so let's get started. Uh, the first thing I want to do is really introduce our speaker, uh, Asia Scudder. I met her uh, probably a year and a half or so ago, and um, she she um, is has a really a great background in ecology and a 20, uh, 20 year career, 20 plus year career in landscape design. So we're very excited to have her with us tonight. Um, her specialty is in creating habitat for wildlife. And she, she works a lot with clients as probably a lot of us do to really help them understand how to succeed with native plant gardens. And that's kind of her specialty. And you'll hear, hear more from her. Um, and about herself and her background as well in her presentation. So I am going to pass this over to you, Asia. Um, so let me change presenters. And, and you should see a prompt, Asia, on your side to um, make yourself, to, so people could see your screen. And um, okay. do you see that? I do, thank okay. you. Okay, super. So we see um, on our side. Right, so you can see the... Um, yeah, the... we see your PowerPoint presentation. It's not full screen, but we do see it. Or I mean, at least I see it. Okay, let me go ahead and I'll put it on the... Uh, okay. There we go. Okay. Well, I'd like to welcome everybody and, and thank you for uh, attending this webinar. I'm so excited to share my experience with, with all of you. Um, I've had a long career in working with builders um, with sustainable landscape design and that's been um, a, a learning, lots of learning curves involved in uh, learning how to communicate and be um, present and ready for a lot of unexpected turns and twists. So um, I was trained as a traditional landscape designer and, and with my background in ecology became more interested in uh, creating landscapes that were suitable to these, I mean I'm glad are new trends in, in sustainability. Um, and I'll tell you more about my company and, and what I've learned and we're going to give you guys lots of opportunities to ask questions. But uh, first of all, I'd like to go ahead and ask Risa to launch a, a quick poll because we, we want to know more about um, each of your backgrounds. And that will also help me kind of tailor some of the comments that I make as, uh, as we do this presentation. Okay, so everybody should be able to see the poll. Um, okay, well, let me hit submit. Oh, no, you should you should be seeing it. Okay, so everybody... Yeah, this is a way for us to learn a little bit more about who's actually in the webinar, um, which was Asia's idea, which I thought was great. And um, so, you know, you can check off, um, 
I think, multiple answers. And so um, once, now can you see the poll, Asia? I can't remember. Um, actually, it says here that the organizer must close the poll to enable screen sharing. Oh, okay. So once you guys answer the poll, um, then I will close it and then you'll be able to see it, Asia. So, okay, uh, so we have uh, most everybody has voted and uh, one of the things from the first webinar we ran, this is the second one, was that people said, you close the polls too quickly. So <laughs> I don't want to close them, but we also didn't want to have sort of dead space in there. So I will give everybody a bit more time to, to, um, to answer the questions and um, I guess people needed a little bit more time to actually read <laughs> everything that was in the polls. So, oh good, okay, so we almost have almost 90% of people have answered, so that's terrific. So I am going to close the poll now, um, and I'm gonna share the results. So you should see that now, Asia, do you see that? Okay, I'm looking, sharing poll results. Um, okay, no, I actually, I don't see it on my, on my screen. Wow. Oh. Okay. Well, I'll let me. I guess then. Um, why do I, Why do you not see that? Okay. Well, I will. Um, well, let me tell you what the answers were then. So, apologize okay. for this. We're just getting used to polls. But um, so, twenty nine percent of people said that they own their own design build landscape companies. Um, 55 percent said that they're landscape architects or landscape designers so that's a good good chunk of people more than half of the folks are architects or, or designers um, 63 percent have said they've worked on sustainable landscape projects so that's that's a lot of you guys obviously are working on some really good you know great projects and only 13 percent said they work with builders regularly so a small percent um, so so then I guess, you know, you probably have a lot to share with them. <laughs> that's, that's great. Well, that's, that certainly gives me um, a good indication of where, where you all are in, in, um, in the world of sustainability. And it certainly is helpful. I'm going to give you um, a quick background on, um, on my business and my company. Okay, I'm going to hide, I'm going to, sorry to interrupt Asia, I'm just going to hide yeah. the results because I think um, everybody should pretty much go back to seeing your screen. I'm sorry, I had to hide them to get your screen back to show everybody. So now you're all set. Okay, and actually, now that, now that we're ready to get started, Risa, I'm just going to have you run one more poll, and if you could, just run the, the poll on those five questions okay. that are sort of general questions about um, the building industry and um, this, the actuality of putting in native plants um, and other types of sustainable ideas um, in a in a commercial landscape. Okay. Yep. So I just launched it. Everybody should sort of see that as well now. Um, and all in progress. Yeah. Okay. Great. So everybody should. I don't see. Oh, people are starting to vote now. So, okay. and um, I guess what I'll do for you, Asia, because for some reason, I'm not sure why you as a panelist don't see the poll, but we'll figure that out for next webinar. But I will <laughs> read you some of the answers as people vote. But um, this is, uh, it says, which one of these is true? Um, or there could be multiple ones that are true. So the ones that are true, you should be checking off. So I don't know if I worded that correctly, but what it means is, you know, check all the ones off that you think are true. Um, and um, so it will be really interesting to see what you guys think. And so we've got a good chunk of people that have uh, voted. Um, and um, I will let you know as soon as uh, it's finished. I'll close the poll, Asia, and then I'll tell you what everybody's answered. And this okay. can sort of set you off now on your on your webinar. <laughs> okay, this is great. Thank you all for your, your patience. And um, it's good to know. Um, as we're participating online, it's it's difficult because, of course, we don't have eye-to-eye -eye contact. So this gives us an opportunity to get to know uh, know you a little better. Um, okay. So I'm going to close the poll now, and I'll share some results. So, so pretty much, okay. Let me read this to you, Asia. So 76 
percent of people think that the trend in the building industry is to be more sustainable. So that's a good percent of people. Zero percent think contractors are using sustainable practices are easy to find. <laughs> <laughs> that's pretty accurate. Probably. Yeah. Um, 84% feel native plants are attractive. And I'm in that group, I could tell you. Um, 46% feel that native plants require little or no mowing, weeding, and watering. So that's a lower percent. Am I saying mm -hmm. these too fast, Asia, or you got it? Oh, you're good. It's great. Yep, okay. I'm making notes while you're... It's oh, great. Perfect. And 62% feel that native plants don't require chemical treatments or fertilizers. That's actually lower than I would think. So, okay, so we are going to hide the results. So now that we're all done with the polls, you can get started and um, it should be, it's right back to your PowerPoint. So we're all set, Asia, for you to go. Okay, great. Okay, well, thank you all again for participating. Um, so let me see if I can let me get back to my PowerPoint here. So first of all, just very quickly, my company um, is Native Landscapes. Uh, I established my company in 1993. And um, it started off, as I said, as a very traditional company. I was trained by a woman who was um, using a lot of herbicides and pesticides and I was watching a degradation of soils over time and became much more interested in organic and sustainable methods of landscaping. So um, I began to create and install very conventional residential designs with organics and mixtures of native plants and traditional uh, horticultural variety greenhouse plants. Um, and we also learned that there are a lot of drainage and water problems and also that people were interested in water catchment. So I began to organize more of my, my business around um, how to either retain water or um, help control some water issues that were occurring on people's properties. Some that were the result of builders uh, improperly um, building homes in a watershed that allowed there to be continued problems. Um, we've created lots and lots and lots of natural stone patios, walkways, garden borders, um, very um, prominent trees for, for people who, who don't want to sacrifice the trees, but also we have a, a company a subcontractor that works with us to what I call gently remove trees for us. Um, I do have a background in ecology, so I have a special interest in using native plants as much as possible. For a while I would think of that in, as espionage. I, I was sneaking native plants into people's gardens um, before they became popular, but um, after a while people, um, especially in the late 90s, and at the turn of to the century, um, people became more interested in sustainability and native plants. I have a special passion for organic lawns and gardens. So I have subcontractors who do uh, strictly organic lawn care for me. This happens to be a residence. You may notice that there's an Obama sign in the, uh, <laughs> in the front, but um, this is a, a uh, lawn and garden that requires no water during the summer. And this is in Oklahoma, so as you know, it's very hot and dry there. Um, but due to the, the um, healthy soils, they're very um, porous and hold water in very efficient ways. So this allows, um, with careful plant choices, and some of these are native plants and some obviously are not, but um, I do try to strike a balance in my company. So all of these skills led to my being contacted by several builders in the area who, in a sense, had nowhere else to turn for help with their sustainable projects. And what was happening was they were getting a lot of pressure to do things in a more sustainable way, um, but lacked the knowledge or the know-how of how to make that happen. So this is just a, a very early picture of a rain garden or a cleansing garden that we created. And I'll talk more about that later. But um, this was a huge project that um, 
was meant to capture water off the watershed from residents who were using chemicals and pull the phosphorus and nitrogen out of those waters before they enter the pond. Um, and then we, taught, we chopped planted uh, native plants, uh, which now are doing quite well. But over time, I learned to really measure the, what I call the green expertise of the builders I worked with. And there were several builders that, that um, I was working with on a regular basis. And some of them were very serious about um, the quality of, of work. And they already had quite a lot of knowledge about uh, sustainability. This is um, a quick picture of Kelly Parker, who owns Guaranteed Watt Staver Systems. And he was creating an entire subdivision that was based on native plantings, uh, organic soils, water catchment, and um, including sustainable building for the homes that they were creating in the subdivision. And then equally, Ideal Homes was also in competition with Kelly, but um, they, they had won many awards for their ener energy efficient homes, but had yet to really capture that same market in the landscape marketplace. So I was uh, fortunate to be in the right place at the right time and worked with some very high quality builders. And now other builders that came to me had no expertise and we'll talk a little bit about what that was like in um, coming against uh, people who really were a little bit worried and concerned about what potential outcomes might be involved in sustainable landscape design. But for a minute I'd like to back up and revisit the polling questions that um, we put forward. So the first one a trend in the building industry is to find ways to be more sustainable. Well, so certainly the building industry has improvements to make in their understanding of the benefits of sustainable building practices. And in my experience, many still choose easier and, well, apparently easier and more traditional methods. However, according to Sustainable Business News, uh, there's approximately 50,000 lead projects it's underway in the United States. There's a fast growth in green retrofits of universities and military bases. And there is certainly predicted to be a greater focus on water reclamation and reduction of use of water across the country. Uh, the second question, contractors trained in sustainable practices are easy to find. Well, as, as the poll showed, right, my experience has been that contractors and sustainable landscape practice are difficult to find and finding them is good but then I also try to let people know that there's quite a lot of time for training um, subs who maybe have built their own uh, style of working in their own traditional ways. Um, so I do, I'm, I'm pretty finicky on a job site and I, I do have a lot of um, guidance and part of that is because I do want to gain the reassurance of the builders that I'm working with. So I want to be sure that my contractors are um, doing a good job. So this happens to be my daughter who's, uh, <laughs> she doesn't look too unhappy working, unloading compost from my truck. Okay, the um, third, third question, native plants are attractive. So I would say that's a matter of perspective, that native plants do indeed provide a diverse habitat and attract many insects, butterflies, and birds. But sometimes, from a builder's perspective, the flowers can be smaller and less showy. So I try to, um, to reassure a builder by letting them know that the blooms do last longer in my experience, and um, that that in the in the, my design process, I design plants to um, to have a um, uh, a big impact. So sometimes I will plant um, annuals in with my native plantings to help offset that that smaller bloom. And then the fourth question, native plants require little or no mowing, weeding, and watering. Well, that can be true. Um, this was a yard that um, it had been a, a lawn, and, and the owner asked us if we could remove the lawn and, and put in all native plants. 
so we did that for him. Um, and we used organic fertilizers, which I'm not sure how many of you have had this experience, but the plants really took off rather quickly. So these, these plants in a matter of six months went from being either one or three gallon containers to being pretty uh, voracious growers. So we had to come in and um, do a little bit of uh, pruning and, and weeding and care. Um, it was actually kind of unexpected for us to and then also, I try. I do try to let my builders know that um, the establishment time for native plants can be a little tricky, and requires a, a little bit more hands-on um, care and watering. And then the fifth question: Native plants do not require chemical treatments or fertilizer. So I I would say that's true. That native plants can easily be grown in non-fertilized areas. In an organic chemical free garden will produce blossoms throughout the season and this is just a very simple garden uh, with native flocks, moonbeam coreopsis up front um, that did indeed bloom in Oklahoma that would bloom from May through November. So um, before okay so before I go to the next slide I guess I'd like to Risa, just take a minute and stop and see if there's any questions at this point. Okay, so Asia, I took myself uh, off. Looks. Can you hear me? I took myself off mute. I'm sorry. Um, okay. Oh yeah, I can hear you. Mm -hmm. So um, yeah, if you folks have any questions, send them along. Um, I just sent um, a, a post by John, John Gishnock. I hope I pronounced that right. But he was talking about the fact that using native plants, you know, like sort of designing beyond the bloom, which I know I did a lot when I did, um, you know, did design gardens with native plants, but you're talking about convincing people about the form and the texture and the lasting seed heads and fall color, which those are, I always used to say that native plants really adapted to our season so much better. So they always had sort of a four season appeal oftentimes. Um, so, you know, that's probably another great way to pitch native plants beyond the bloom. But, but what happens, I think, is that a lot of times people um, are so used to seeing those big blooms like that, that that's what they want, right? Mm hmm Right. And, and with builders who have pressure, uh, for instance, when I worked with Ideal Homes, the average price of their home was about $350,000. So they had clients who were or homeowners who uh, not only appreciated but rather expected to have quite a nice entry yeah. um, when they came in. So um, promising, you know, this sort of being careful about making promises about the appearance of things. Um, but certainly texture is, is um, really vital and, and can play a big role in, in creating some of those bridges seasonally. Yeah. yeah. So, and then Diana mentioned pycnanthemum. I, I never get that right, but if you're talking about the, the mint, which I love, that, that, that native mint is fantastic. I have that in my garden. And grasses also, native grasses. There's a lot of mm -hmm. appeal for those too. So, yep, Diana said, yeah, that, that, that pycnanthemum muticum, but I love that plant. So, um, it's a challenge. And I think the more that you know about plants and the more of the, like, like, you know, if you study native plants, our palate and understanding what the palate of native plants are is much larger than probably the average traditional builder even, you know, so that really helps. Um, there doesn't seem to be more questions either, Asia, so I think we're, you know, we're good. Okay. Okay, that's great. Good. We'll, we'll move right along here. Um, so, so just sort of in summary, I'm really upfront with all of my clients. And I do let them know that uh, maintaining a naturalized area requires special training of lawn and garden crews. So for instance, when I worked with Ideal Homes, um, their crews were prone to pull out all the perennials in the spring, especially thinking that they were weeds. So I would have to um, orient them towards um, the the, you know, it's sort of like every season I had to be on site to, to train to train them or bring in my own people, which could be more expensive. So often there was a, a little bit of a negotiating 
process with the builder depending on um, how much money they felt like they had to spend. And um, But it, I could say that honestly that was a little bit of a frustrating process and um, there are often times where the builder would just give up and say forget it, we're just putting in pansies or we're just putting in mums and never mind, we don't want to deal with all of this um, you know, having to replace plants that were uh, inappropriately pulled or something. So um, it took a, a, quite a lot of consistency, and we'll, I'll talk more about that here in a few minutes. Um, I also let my, my clients know that there are times of the year when a natural garden can look less than professional. And of course, as we've said, I do my best to, to create bridges through the season so that there is some of this texture or architecture or using other plants that may be not necessarily purely native. Um, as I said, I have a, a background in ecology, so I came into this world, into the landscape world with the knowledge of seed collection off um, wild prairies and being careful about genotypes and all these things. So um, I found in landscaping it's difficult to stay true to all of that, um, and especially when working with the builders. Um, I have. I also learned I have to make some concessions, in other words, um, and that seemed to work and seemed to kind of help build bridges with, with them and they were more willing to go a little further with me every season. Um, so then the other point is that some plants can be difficult to get established and have special needs in the first months of establishment, so that is a matter of learning for myself that I need to charge a little more to allow for my time to go and check on plant materials. Um, and then the last point, that native plants benefit a wide range of organisms and do attract a diverse animal population. And I'll talk more about that also, but there certainly were builders that were less than happy with some of the animals that showed up in uh, some of the, the um, wild areas that got planted. Even though it's what they had approached me for and asked me for, then there were complaints in one case that there were too many salamanders um, on the sidewalks or, you know, I don't know, people got nervous about having animals around there in their neighborhood. So what does this all really have to do with working with builders? And um, what about the positive features of a sustainable, natural, organic landscape. So just to kind of segue, many builders new to sustainable landscapes, in my experience, they voice concerns with me that, that green may be more expensive than traditional landscape construction methods. As we've said, that unwanted animals may be attracted to the site. And if there's a lack of ex expertise in the subcontractors, then maybe there'd be, there might be uncertain results. In other words, who's going to install and maintain a specialized sustainable garden? So let's answer some of these concerns. What about the cost? Let's talk about that. So generally, my cost, my experience has been that green materials cost about the same or less than conventional materials. And especially this is true when looking at use over time. And those of you who are um, in the sustainable field know that natural cycles really do replace the need for addition of expensive fertilizers. And really, um, as the plants reach maturity, there's very little maintenance that's needed. Um, and maybe a, a twice a year maintenance need, but there's not that uh, weekly need, for instance, in mowing a lawn or, or doing um, heavy trimming of boxwood shrubs or hollies. Um, and so let me go through a couple of these and then we'll take another break for questions in a minute here. So then the question for a builder may ask, do natural plantings attract unwanted insects or other animals? And I would have to say that, you know, the question is, is you know, what is an unwanted animal? Um, I, I did a, a complete um, a soil amendment for um, a very prominent landscape architect in Oklahoma City and the, the grounds looked absolutely gorgeous but it attracted a whole 
a series of new animals to his yard, including moles. Um, so he was having lots of mole disruption in his lawn and um, other kinds of bees and wasps and um, squirrels. There was just a whole influx of wildlife, which he was a little bit unsettled with. And so much of that is a matter of perspective and learning. Um, one of the things that we did do at Ideal Homes when there was um, this um, problem with salamanders is we put up uh, learning um, boards for people who were walking along the sidewalks so they could learn more about the benefits of, of uh, creating homes and habitats for, for the wildlife. And that seemed to help, um, just this, a little bit of education. And then it was something they were proud of instead of feeling aggravated by. And again, just an added note that um, it's good to factor in added time to train subcontractors. And it's good to let the builder know that, that you're willing to take the responsibility um, to give guidance to subcontractors on care and maintenance of sustainable landscapes. They really are so much different. I mean, I, I really see them as being um, a completely different mindset and a, a completely different way of, of planting, which I'm sure many of you would agree agree with that. Um, so let me pause there, Risa, and go ahead, and I'm going to go ahead and, and take another break for questions to see if anybody, since we're online, I'm just, just kind of yeah. want to get a reading on where people are, if there's any questions. So John, Gishnock again, I'm sorry if I didn't pronounce it right, but well, he had one, the first question he had was, can you define what a builder is specifically? Do they sell what they build to private homeowners? And he's just talking about, are you talking mostly about residential builders or uh, versus probably commercial, obviously? So, but you, your experience is mainly with residential, I assume. Oh, that's a great question. Yeah, this is um, the three main builders I've worked with are are really responsible for building subdivisions where there are 20 to 30 homes usually and um, um, right so they so the, the mindset is is really pleasing private home, homeowners who come into the subdivision and want to be comfortable and feel as if the neighborhood is suited to their their level of comfort well because he, he wanted to say, he wanted to know if builders ever refer you right to the client, but it sounds like you worked with, like, so that you would have a direct relationship with the client, um, but it sounds like you are you worked mainly with people that were kind of doing new developments. Maybe the homes weren't even sold at that point, right? Exactly. Yeah, that's right. And and um, that's right. And even in one case, um, again, going back to Ideal Homes, they were trying to sidestep some of the use of... Um, Bermuda lawns or other kinds of lawns mm -hmm. and replacing that with buffalo grass in Oklahoma that that works fairly well but um, they were trying to do that before the homeowners purchased and moved into their own homes so that those were established so there yeah. wasn't um, uh, a question about the lawns and I think I think in general builders when they're building a home they're usually you know that's at the that's the point when they kind of have to make the landscape look good before they sell it I would in, in a lot of cases, right? Versus once they're sold already, mm -hmm. the homeowner would end up calling you maybe to change their landscape or right? Is that you know what right. I mean? Right. Yeah. So they would certainly pass my mm -hmm. right. So they would pass my name on to the to the landowner. Um, but honestly, often in my experience, these were people who were kind of um, in and out of their homes going to work, traveling, doing things, they were they were pretty happy as long as the landscape was established once they moved in. There wasn't a lot of changes in my experience that they wanted to make after at that point. So now this is funny. Tony Bailey says, so what do you tell them when moles turn up? <laughs> I know. This is right. So I, I try first to do the... Um, the let's be friendly to moles speech, which is, <laughs> um, you know, that they aerate the soil and they're eating grubs and they're really good. They're good hosts to have. Um, yeah. 
and if that doesn't work, then we use castor oil to uh, just spray on the surface of the soil, and the moles don't like the smell, and they go to the neighbors <laughs> typically. Oh, oh that's so. Not a perfect scenario. Um, so I always, I always try education first. And um, I actually, once I had a, a client who, a residential client, who wanted her grass to look as green as the client's place across the yard, which was organic. And she did not have an organic lawn at that time. She was really nervous about switching away from chem lawn and going into a organic treatment and, and she was part of what she was worried about was moles and, and other kinds of animals that would come in and it took a, it took me about nine months to really just educate her um, about the benefits of having those kinds of animals in your in your yard and that diversity um, being a good thing and not something to feel concerned about and she finally did make the switch and she's been so happy with all of that and she doesn't worry about her dogs having chemicals on on their fur and this that and the other so it all it all turned out well but it did take quite a lot of you know a lot of conversations and a lot of talking yeah to, uh, mm -hmm. yeah my I mean I've done a lot of native gardens and my experience is that it's so if you just you know kind of balance everything everything seems sort of balanced you don't get kind of an over overage of any one specific thing of course when I know when you have a gopher, that's a real problem in a vegetable garden, but that could be another talk. <laughs> but I mean, in general, right. you know, um, in general, there just seems to be like a right balance somehow when you kind of have everything working together somehow, you know. Exactly. Not, uh, yeah. So yeah. I just, and a little bit of patience. And yeah. yeah. Um, so we have one more question from Edward. It's do you approach the builders or do they approach you to work with them? Well, in in um, Oklahoma, I was fortunate to be one of the few people that was doing sustainable landscape design. I just happened to be at the right place at the right time. So, um, in that case, they would approach me, and and that that was a favorable position to be in. I think it's difficult to go to somebody um, and try to convince them of an of a different approach, but. Once you've established yourself with one builder, it's pretty good to, you know, ask them even for a reference or or say, you know, if you like this work, would you be willing to um, write a statement, uh, a testimonial for me? And I've I've done that in the in the past, um, and I imagine it's I'm thinking that it's probably more competitive out out here in the on the eastern seaboard. Yeah. Well, what I, the other thing is, um, Asia, were, the builders you were working with, would you say that they were sort of more uh, like they were building more green buildings, like more energy efficient buildings or like the, did they have a little bit of more of a sustainability sensibility with their actual buildings? It sounds like they may. Yeah, have. they they did. And, and they were also really taking advantage advantage of the lead system. So they were getting a lot of tax incentives and oh. they were wanting to continue to get some of those, um, you know, um, you know, kind of pats on the back, but also getting financial rewards for, for doing as much sustainable building as possible, including uh, creating sustainable landscape installations. Yeah. But it's so good to uh, it's sometimes, yeah. So it's good to sort of even approach builders. You never know; like they may be working with a traditional landscape company and maybe didn't even realize that sometimes that there's companies out there that were willing to work with them through the building process to do more sustainable landscapes. You know, I mean, um, and if you educate them, like mm -hmm. you said, you know, there there could be a good, you know, I mean, it's always worth a try to go out and approach builders. So. Um, well, and in fact, that's a really great segue into the next slide, which is how can you help your client feel confident that a sustainable project is right for them? And that's really, if they're not already on board, that's a, a really good question. So sometimes I'll just throw some hard facts at them, in like this, this slide uh, is kind of a series of facts about lawns, um, and it's more of a, a country wide view or perspective on how we treat lawns and how much energy and um, there's not really um, dollar amounts on this particular slide but I know that um, 
I don't know if, if any of you are familiar with Howard Garrett out of Texas, but he's done some really groundbreaking work with golf courses and has turned some of golf courses in Texas into organic greenways and has saved um, hundreds of thousands of dollars in costs of water and fertilizer uh, for those golf courses just really by using uh, corn gluten meal and liquid molasses. And very, very exciting to hear him talk about that. I have a, at the end of this presentation, I have a, um, a, um, a resource list, and he's on that list, so you can write down his, um, his information. But um, sometimes just hard, cold hard facts. This is how much money you'll save if you do um, an organic or sustainable landscape program. Um, and certainly that was some of what, in Oklahoma again, some of the builders were very interested in cutting their water costs, which could run easily into the hundreds of thousands of dollars over a year. So these are the things when I do approach a builder, or they approach me, um, I like to kind of do a quick survey of what their experience is with sustainability. And I'd like to know what their expectations are. And then I try to create a very clear vision for them of what I'm going to do and create so that there's no confusion. So this is just a, a re, recounting of that. Um, what is your client's knowledge of and experience with sustainable materials and practices? So this kind of helps you gear your presentation to your client with as much accurate information as you think is needed. And also, a client who's new to sustainable design, you, you may just kind of plan to give them a lot more time um, and devote, devote that time to explanations of what the process looks like and what the outcome might look like. And sometimes, there's a, you know, it's, uh, it can look messy and funny. I've shown up at um, some of these subdivisions with truckloads of cardboard to put down on top of Bermuda grass. and. But, you know, you get a lot of funny looks from the guys that are laying um, brick or doing other kinds of sprinkler work, all that stuff. <laughs> so it's good to let the builder know what you're up to before you get there with, with weird materials, I think. Um, it's also important to know what the expectations of your client is. So maybe he or she are, is wanting to reduce water usage, and save money. Maybe they've heard that it's good to reduce the amount of lawn that you have, or they just don't want the mowing costs or the fertilizer cost. And so the question is, how can you demonstrate some practical facts on what their potential savings is by reducing those, those elements for them? If you're familiar with lead points, um, you know that, that some builders are, are interested in gaining those points, and they do get incentives financially. Sometimes that's from um, the municipality that they're a part of. Um, and then they may actually have a, a true concern about the use of pesticides and herbicides, which is great. And if they already are thinking in terms of the ecology, I think you're a step ahead with them. That's good. Um, also, their timetable and what their budget is. Um, sometimes, in my experience, these sustainable designs are a bit more um, hands-on, a little more work. Um, they're time-consuming. It's not like the crew comes in with a big truckload of um, uh, boxwoods and hollies and hostas, puts them in in a day, and it's finished. So, so, so it's good to know if the builder has a timetable and let them know it may take um, longer than what would be a normal or standard traditional landscape installation. And then also, you know, you may not ask them this straight out, but you might, um, wondering if they're interested in having a reputation of being recognized as a green builder. And sometimes that can um, be a selling point for uh, uh, a builder, and especially these days, much more, much more compelling. And then I just thought, you know, for those of you who are not interested or not familiar with LEED, um, just a quick synopsis of what LEED can provide for your client. So um, 
it's uh, these this, these points that it can lower operating costs and increase asset value for the property. Sort of the obvious that it can conserve energy, water, and other resources. That it's healthier and safer for occupants, and as as I've said, that they can qualify for money saving incentives, tax rebates, and and sometimes zoning allowances that they may not otherwise um, be approved of, be approved for. And then just sort of um, this idea of communicating an accurate vision for a builder's property is vital. So this is something, as you can imagine, the builder has poured his heart and his, his uh, soul into, in a way. There's a, a lot on the line for, for these people. And um, millions of dollars invested in property. And um, they want to do the right thing. What I've noticed, my experience, is that they, they do want to do the right thing, but they're concerned about what, what it might look like. So if I say to a builder, look, you can use native plants and have a design with an outcome like this, and I tell them that it's native plants, sometimes I think in their minds they think it's going to look like this, and it's going to be um, a disaster. And all they hear are the complaints of their homeowners, wondering why things look so weedy and brown. And likewise, if I'm trying to implement something like a rain garden, um, I can see the outcome and see how beautiful it can look, but sometimes I think they may think that it's going to be a weed patch. Not that to me this looks beautiful, but they may see it differently. See that it's um, uh, just a, you know, an, a disorganized grouping of plants or something. So, the idea of reputation is really primary. And as I have repeated, that I worked with Ideal Homes. They were a major player in Oklahoma City. They've now moved into Texas and the Dallas area. Um, they've won national awards for their efficient homes. And their reputation was, was important to them each and every day. And I, I needed to remember that as um, kind of a, you know, I, I don't mean to say this in a derogatory way, but I was kind of like a granola head, you know, <laughs> very uh, laid back landscaper. So this is just an example of one of their award-winning energy efficient homes. They, they hired an architect to design this home that had a zero use um, energy and they had no matching landscape to go with it. So um, when they contacted my company, we were happy and, and really quite proud to, to work with them to do what we could. And we did have some failures. Uh, it's, in Oklahoma, is really hard clay soils um, that are, are difficult to transition into um, healthy, living, viable soils. And, and so it, it did take a while for us to figure out a balance with ideal homes. But we did, and we worked our way into um, this is another picture of the cleansing garden that we built. Um, this was designed by a landscape architect. Um, who then contacted my company to install this. And it's, it's an eight foot deep um, cleansing garden, a rain garden. And there's um, layers of fly ash and different uh, layers of minerals. So there's eight different, um, this eight different layers in that. It was very complicated to put together, but um, it really works, and they, there's a testing pump there, so they can. The architect does go every few months and test to see how well the how well it's doing at filtering out nitrogen and, and uh, phosphates, phosphorus. As as you can see, the homes are very conventional, and unfortunately, many of the the homeowners did revert to using chemicals on their lawns. Um, so. That's just sort of the way that worked, but um, we are happy to be a part of that project. So um, just as we're kind of wrapping up here, just a reminder that it's good to always look for ways to improve communication with your client. So this includes providing a reasonable assessment of timelines for a start and completion of a project with updates as needed. So for instance, one year we had given them a, a very reasonable 
schedule for completion and then we had six weeks of rain that was really unprecedented and so we just stayed in contact with them and let them know um, how progress was going or not going in that case um, as long as we stayed in contact that we, we stayed on good ground with them and then it was also really important to stay within budget I found that they'd been burned several times by not only other landscapers but builders um, all across the board so I enjoyed really creating a budget that suited my needs and when I presented it to them I knew that I was going to be able to um, to meet the project demands and also be reimbursed fairly for my work and my time um, also just you probably all know this but it's good to have or it's vital or important that you have insurance coverage so I always carried at least a million dollar policy with my company and some of my subcontractors also had insurance but some of them didn't and so I would be sure to write in um, a sub policy to, to cover uh, anyone who was working under underneath me and not always um, but Sometimes I would create opportunities to make a formal introduction of the subcontractors to the builder. Some municipalities that are doing quite a lot to um, create urban sustainable ecosystems. And some of those are rainwater catchment systems and others are, are just zero scape plantings or using um, uh, less lawn or organic fertilizers and that is one thing that I, I could recommend to all of you is um, I've found in general that cities are very open to progressive ideas regarding sustainable landscape installations and designs and uh, planting butterfly gardens or replacing synthetic fertilizers with organic fertilizers uh, generally I've, I've found um, there to be quite a lot of openness and appreciation of, of that. Uh, it certainly saves those cities a lot of money and shows the citizens that there's an overall um, appreciation or care for the environment. And so just as a quick summary and then any last questions, uh, a well thought out design will fit your client's site and it takes into consideration local conditions including aesthetics, the availability of water, and accessibility for maintenance. Um, I, I would like to just sort of summarize by saying that it's important to reinforce the benefits of a sustainable landscape design, even if it's a simple suggestion such as planting a tree for shade or using native plants to reduce water use or I might add to attract butterflies or bees. Uh, it's very simple and um, uh, to improve soils using organic soil conditioners and there certainly are lots and lots of uh, resources available for uh, water saving ideas um, and just as a final note consistency really matters so when you're approaching builders who tend to be uh, conservative and um, very focused on profits um, this idea of, of doing what you say you're going to do and following through really really makes a difference and sometimes that can win out over other competing landscape companies who may be traditional and non-organic or non-sustainable but are, are not as uh, reliable so um, when you do start working with builders be sure to, to, to follow through and be consistent and here's just a few um, sites. I've included the ELA, but the U.S. Green Building Council and um, Howard Garrett out of Texas, who's done incredible work at um, entering into commercial industry with ideas of organic um, soils, native plants, pesticide, organic pesticides and herbicides. He's really, really, really dug his feet in, so to speak, and, and done quite a lot of work. Um, and then just as a final slide, if, you, if you'd like, here's some examples of ways to achieve lead points 
for new landscape projects. And with that, I'm going to open up to questions. Okay, so I think there's a few questions left. <laughs> so the first one was, um, you talk a lot about like the educational time that you spend uh, with your builders. Do you add that into sort of what you charge for your clients? Like yeah, at that time, do you you know add it in? I I do add it in. Um, I it depends on the builder. Sometimes. Um, I will let them know exactly what the consulting fee is. Um, when, in one case with uh, guaranteed what systems, I did um, a, a, really a seminar for a group of employees, and so I did let them know what I would charge charge for that. And um, also, I think there is. Um, there's room for, I, I hate to say like doctoring my, my prices, but a little bit of that, like buffering some of my prices in order to allow for an hour here, or an hour there, or an hour there. Um, if it gets to be a lot, I do let the builder know that I need to start formally charging for cons consultation. Mm. So we have another question from Fallon is, how do you, how do you go about finding bil builders who want to do sustainable development? I know they found you, I think, the ones you worked with, or did you, you know, do you have any suggestions for people to find sustainable uh, or builders? Um, yeah, I have um, just recently, um, I, I have just relocated relo to the East Coast, and I did approach um, a business, not necessarily a builder, about their um, landscape and in that case I really just really knocked on the door and said look this is who I am and this is what I do and um, I really would appreciate an opportunity to to at a reduced rate give you um, um, a treatment on organics this and maybe sprucing up this and adding a little here and I, I explained the ways that that would improve their landscape and could improve their costs and in this case this, uh, this woman business owner was very ho open and happy to accept. Um, There's quite a few more um, webinars coming up so you can look for the webinar information is definitely on the Ecological Landscaping Association's page, uh, ecolandscaping.org. And uh, there's actually, it's on the nav bar, navigation bar, there's a, a section for webinars and all of the archives for those webinars will be available soon there as well. So please join us in some more webinars. And again, thank you very much for attending and I hope you guys have a, have a good evening. Good night.